There is a powerful and mysterious force in human nature that is capable of bringing about dramatic improvement in our lives. Recently, it's caught the attention of doctors, psychologists, and thinkers everywhere. And a new word has been coined to describe it. That word is imaging. Imaging. The forming of mental pictures or images is based on the principle that there is a deep tendency in human nature to ultimately become precisely what we imagine or image ourselves to be. Imaging is positive thinking carried one step further. In imaging, you do not merely think about a hoped-for goal. You see or visualize it with tremendous intensity. Imaging is a kind of laser beam of the imagination, a shaft of mental energy in which the desired goal or outcome is pictured so vividly by the conscious mind that the unconscious mind accepts it and is activated by it. This releases powerful internal forces that can bring about astronomical and astonishing changes in your life. Take, for example, the story of Roger Ferger, a poor youngster with no connections or advantages. One day, he was passing by the offices of the Cincinnati Inquirer, looked inside the window, and was awed and inspired by watching the newspaper's editor hard at work. From that day on, he pictured himself in a similar setting, prayed that it would happen, and worked hard. Years later, he was not only editor, but owner and publisher of the Cincinnati Inquirer. He made positive imaging work for him. The images that affect us most strongly are the self-images that we develop as we move through the years. Sometimes these images are positive. Sometimes they're negative. I know that as a youngster in various small Midwestern towns, I had some pretty negative self-images, only I didn't call them that. I'm not sure the term inferiority complex had been invented yet. But if an inferiority complex means a whole nest of inadequacy feelings, that's what I had. I felt that I didn't measure up to my parents' expectations. I was a slender, lightweight, with little athletic ability. I was a preacher's kid, and felt I always had to... The result of all of these factors was that when I got to college and had to get up occasionally in class and give answers, I acted like my self-image said I was, inferior and inadequate. This self-image of inadequacy might have gone on indefinitely had it not been for something a professor said to me during my sophomore year. He said I had a reasonably good mind, but that I was not making adequate use of it by being so hesitant and bashful. How long are you going to be like this, he demanded, a scared rabbit afraid of the sound of your own voice? You probably excuse yourself by thinking that you're just naturally shy. Well, you'd better change the way you think about yourself, Peel, and you'd better do it now, before it's too late. To this day, I remember the emotions that roared through me as I left the classroom. I was angry. I was resentful, I was hurt. But most of all, I was frightened because I knew that what the professor had said was true. How far would I get in life if I kept on seeing myself as a scared rabbit? I sat down on the steps of the chapel and prayed the deepest, most desperate prayer of my whole life. Please help me, I prayed. Please change me. I know you can do it. Let me see myself not as a scared rabbit, but as someone who can do great things in my life, because you are with me, giving me the strength and confidence I need. I don't know how long I sat there on the chapel steps, but when I got up, something had changed. Of course, the inferiority feelings weren't all gone. I still have some of them to this day. But the image I had of myself was changed, and with it, the course of my whole life. As the years went by, I began using imaging techniques whenever I wanted to achieve a certain goal. In my pocket is a card that I always carry with me. It came to me many years ago, and I've retyped it occasionally because it gets ragged and worn. On it are five lines that say, The light of God surrounds me. The love of God enfolds me. The power of God protects me. The presence of God watches over me. Wherever I am, God is. Why do I carry this card? Because the image it evokes of a loving, caring God is the perfect antidote to fear, to worry, to anxiety, to just about every problem under the sun. Whenever I'm troubled, I take that card out and let it remind me that there is an all-powerful being in the universe who loves me and who is only a prayer away. 
This is the greatest concept that the human mind can hold. The more intensely you image it, the happier you're going to be, because you'll never feel abandoned or alone. That's what religion is all about. You are greater than anything that can happen to you. This is a basic fact about human beings and their problems. In big and terrifying crises, people find within themselves a power and a strength and also a wisdom they had no idea they possessed. Here's an example. Peggy Paul was diagnosed as having terminal cancer. Determined not to die, she began imaging herself as healthy. She also pictured her body fighting the cancerous cells. She reorganized her positive goals and life priorities. She visualized the battle for health as being gradually won, meanwhile continuing under regular medical treatment. Twenty-two months after her liver cancer was diagnosed, a fourth liver scan confirmed what Mrs. Paul had imaged for so long. The tumor in her liver had indeed shrunk. The scan showed a normal liver. Peggy Paul, we're told, now gives to all who show an interest a card on which are printed the words, Whatever your mind can conceive and believe, and your heart desire, you can achieve. And so imaging gave new life to one who could indeed conceive and believe. This is a powerful process, but it doesn't have to be a complicated process. Sometimes a simple mental picture can help you get rid of your troubles. Half a century of trying to relieve people in distress has left my wife Ruth and me convinced of three things. One, every human being has an enormous built-in problem-solving potential. It's only when that potential is blocked or weakened by defeatist attitudes or negative emotions that problems seem unsolvable. Two, problems are an essential and necessary ingredient of life. They can actually be good for you, although they may be painful at the time. All worthwhile achievements are the result of problem solving. Three, the basic tools of problem solving are available to anyone. One of the most effective is this technique of imaging. Anybody can experiment with it. There's nothing very difficult about it. It can be applied to just about any problem under the sun. One cautionary word, though, right here at the start. Make God a silent partner in all forms of imaging, because he is the touchstone that will keep your desires on the high plane of morality where they belong. Imaging can be applied to unworthy goals as well as worthy ones. Dr. Smiley Blanton, famous psychiatrist and one of the wisest men I've ever known, used to say that day in and day out, the most common problem he was called upon to deal with in his patients was lack of self-esteem. Most of the people who consulted him, Smiley said, were deficient in self-love. They had a poor opinion. That is to say, a poor image of themselves. Inferiority complex. How would you define it? I think I'd say it was timidity in the presence of life. And Smiley was right. It is very common. I have found in my own counseling experience that often the most outwardly confident and aggressive people are using that apparent confidence as a mask for deep doubts about themselves and their ability to cope with the challenges and problems of living. It's almost as if there were two separate warring entities inside each of us, the strong and the weak, the bold and the fearful, the large and the small. Each of us has a big me and a little me inside, and many times the little me frustrates and paralyzes the big me. I remember reading some years ago about the famous Italian tenor Enrico Caruso, surely one of the greatest masters of song ever to step onto a stage. In later life, his confidence was enormous, but at the beginning of his career, he was unsure and uncertain. One opening night at the opera, Caruso was standing in the wings waiting to go on when he was seized by an overwhelming attack of stage fright. His throat became constricted, perspiration poured from him. He was actually shaking with fear. Then the stagehands nearby were astonished to hear him say in a whispered command, Out, you miserable little me! Get out of my way. Out, out. By a tremendous effort of will, Caruso was changing his self-image. He was saying to the fearful, timid element inside of him that the strong, positive element inside him must prevail, would prevail. And in the face of this fierce counterattack, the little me shrank away. He went on stage where he sang with beauty and power. But there are millions of people who don't know how to shake off doubts and fears. Millions crawl through life on their hands and knees, 
instead of standing tall and proud. I sympathize with them from the bottom of my heart because I know what psychic pain is like. So what can you do if you have an ego that needs bolstering? How can you stop imaging yourself as an inadequate person, an attitude that just perpetuates the state of affairs you want to avoid? The first thing is examine your entire life and see if you can pinpoint some specific cause for these inferiority feelings. Often the cause goes back to childhood. Certainly we're not born with them. But even so, that self-confidence we have as babies can be damaged, sometimes by a harsh parent, by other children who tease or ridicule, sometimes by siblings who outshine or overshadow a sensitive brother or sister. I tell everyone who has an inferiority complex the basic answer to the problem is to get a deep sense of the presence of God in your life. Image yourself walking alongside the power that created the tiniest flower and holds the constellations in their places. This is the surest way to cast out all fear and shrinking sense of failure. How do you do it? Well, the answers have been given so often that they sound hackneyed and trite, but they are eternally true. You pray. You go where God is talked about and thought about and focused on, and that usually is in church or some spiritual group of which there are many. You read the scriptures and apply what you read to yourself. Select one of those problems that looms so large in your mind and take some action against it. Remember what Emerson said, Do the thing you fear, and the death of fear is certain. Suppose you're afraid to ask the boss for a raise. Summon up your courage and ask him if you honestly think you deserve it. You may not get it, but you will have done wonders for yourself anyway, because you will have broken through the fear barrier, and that is of more value than a larger paycheck. Self-doubt sets up a barrier, and timid people turn back when they encounter it. They keep turning back until it becomes a habit, a bad habit. But if you crash through it, if you make yourself ask for that raise, if you do the things you fear just once, the barrier is broken and your image of yourself is upgraded. Confidence begins to flow into your mind and drive out the doubts and the feelings of inadequacy. One more suggestion. If you feel inadequate, sometimes it's a good idea to ask yourself, inadequate compared to what? I've known people who were despondent and downcast because they allowed themselves to become victims of two great expectations. For example, I knew a young man who was distressed because he was not a good football player, and that displeased his father, who had been an All-American fullback. Image yourself as a worthwhile person. Act as if you were someone worthy of admiration and respect. And gradually, that's what you'll come to be. What you can image, you will be in the long run. With the possible exception of health problems, money problems weigh more heavily on people's minds than any other form of anxiety. Ruth and I are constantly made aware of this by the mail that reaches us. Despairing letters from elderly people whose fixed incomes are being eroded by inflation. Frantic letters from young people caught in the quicksand of installment buying or credit card spending. Panicky letters from people staggering under mountainous debts. Fear-filled letters from people who have lost their jobs. The list goes on and on. In trying to solve life's problems, imaging is only one of the many techniques. Through the years, Trying to help people in financial difficulty, Ruth and I have worked out half a dozen simple suggestions that seem to be effective. The first is simply this. Don't panic. If you find anxiety getting the upper hand, go to work imaging peace of mind. The simple act of praying creates an image of your problem being brought to the source of all wisdom, and that is tremendously reassuring and comforting. Then, when you have your emotions under control, the next step is to get organized. Make a complete list of all your debts, everything you owe. Make another list of essential expenses. Add up all sources of income and see what you can count on. Visualize yourself living within your income with a fraction left over for debt reduction. Paint that image vividly in your mind. Next, be disciplined. You have to learn to ignore that sly little destructive demon named instant gratification who lurks in all of us and whispers, that's pretty, get it, or that's a bargain, grab it. A fourth suggestion we sometimes offer is blunt and to the point. Think. If you'll just sit down and really think, you may come up with an idea or an insight that can change everything. 
The fifth step is to give all you can to others. Giving is the best way to put yourself in the great invisible stream of abundance that surges through the universe. Finally, visualize yourself as debt-free. Imagine vividly the relief, the happiness, and the peace of mind that you'll feel when the last payment is made. Hold that idea in your conscious mind until it sinks down into your unconscious mind. And then you'll have it forever, because it will have you. One never knows exactly what kind of spark will set a person on fire. I once knew a salesman whose life seemed to exhibit a consistent pattern of failure. He worried constantly and tried selling many different items, but nothing ever worked. Then one day someone handed him a piece of paper with a three-line affirmation on it. It went like this. I believe that I am always divinely guided. I believe that I will always take the right turn in the road. I believe that God will make a way where there is no way. Three lines. Nothing very complicated, but this salesman took them to heart, and they changed his life. He went on to become one of the very best salesmen in his part of the country, all because his life had been revolutionized by three simple phrases, each beginning with two magic words, I believe. But there is also such a thing as negative imaging, and the most common name for it is worry. When we worry, we're using imaging all right, but we're pointing it in the wrong direction. When we worry about our health, or our children, or our jobs, or our future, we're giving these fears a degree of reality by allowing them to pervade and color our thinking. And if they dominate our minds, they may also affect our actions. Just as affirmative imaging tends to actualize desirable events, so negative imaging or worry tends to create conditions in which the unpleasant thing that is worried about has a better chance of coming to pass. Let's be realistic. Anyone who has any imagination at all is going to be concerned now and then. A little worry is probably a good thing if it impels you to take prudent action. It's chronic worry that is dangerous, the constant imaging of undesirable events. The occasional worrier takes affirmative action. The chronic worrier becomes exhausted and confused. How do you get rid of the clammy, clutching hands of worry around your neck? How do you let go of worry thoughts with their bleak images of future problems or disasters lurking just around the next bend in the road? Let me give you a few tips that have helped me outwit worry. First, if you have something preying on your mind, think about it. Stop imaging the worst possible eventuality and reacting with fear and dread and apprehension. I'm convinced we can control almost anything in our lives by thought. Therefore, worry, which is an irrational reaction, can be controlled by thinking rationally. Take a worry apart. Lay it out, dissect it, analyze it. If you'll do this with clear, cool, rational thinking, you'll find that nine times out of ten, there won't be much left. Another way to break the worry pattern is to divert yourself. This is not hard because, fortunately, the human mind is designed so that it cannot hold more than one idea at a time. You cannot actively worry about something when you're deliberately focusing on something else. So when worry has you by the throat, the simplest way to break its grip is to do something that you enjoy doing. Dig in the garden, play a game of golf, arrange some flowers, bake a cake, or sing a song. If all else fails, turn on the television. Anything to get your mind off yourself. Loneliness is another problem that plagues many individuals. I've even heard that it exists in epidemic proportions. Let's take a look at this affliction and try to list some countermeasures. First, I think it helps to realize that being alone doesn't necessarily make you lonely. I know quite a few people who actually enjoy solitude because they've mastered the art of living pleasantly with themselves. However, if the time you spend alone is going to be good, you have to know yourself and like yourself. Knowing yourself means understanding what makes you happy, what makes you sad, gives you pleasure, and what bores you. Take me. I'm a worker. I like to work, and I feel happiest when I'm working. Holidays tend to make me restless because I have the uncomfortable feeling that I'm wasting my time. I like the satisfaction that comes from getting things done. So when I have to be alone, I'm able to live pleasantly with myself by filling my hours with the work I love. Then... There's the question of liking yourself. Most of us think of ourselves quite favorably most of the time. But there are a surprising number of people whose self-esteem is too low. 
People who have done things they're ashamed of or who suffer from an inferiority complex demand too much of themselves and then blame themselves when they fall short. How are other people going to be attracted to them if they don't like themselves? The plain truth is many lonely people are lonely because they turn other people off. They're irritable or rude or complaining or critical or self-centered or just plain dull. So if you're lonely, you must face the possibility that something in your own personality is causing that loneliness. And if it is, you have to isolate it and actively do something about it. Try to see yourself as others see you. Another cure for loneliness lies in that old exhortation, don't just sit there, do something. One of the most common causes of loneliness is inertia and the apathy that comes from not having enough to do. If you're lonely, you can't just wait for someone to come along and rescue you. You have to be willing to make a move yourself. Form a picture of the interesting life you want to live and of one in which you have many friends and exciting interests. Hold that image and move constantly toward it. The mental picture will reproduce itself as fact. I'm convinced that successful people in all walks of life use imaging constantly, whether they know it or not. Let's talk a bit about the part it plays. Imaging can help in three crucial areas. The first is goal setting. If any endeavor is to succeed, the first thing you must do is choose your goal. Visualize it clearly and fix a specific date for arriving at it. Imaging a goal is a kind of promissory note made out to yourself. And even when these pledges are made casually or only half seriously, the unconscious mind hears them and reacts to them. If setting worthy goals is the first step on the road to success, the second is belief. No, the conviction that you are capable of achieving these goals. There has to be in your mind the unshakable image of yourself succeeding at the goal you've set for yourself. The more vivid the image is, the more obtainable the goal becomes. Positive imaging may also be a key to good health. Not long ago, I came across a newspaper story in which a California physician, Dr. Irving Oyl, was quoted as saying that people could live to be 150 years old if they would just practice a combination of right thinking and prayer. Hope, faith, truth. These seem to be the key. When you have them, you can image your own recovery and speed the healing process. When you don't have them, you can't. Dr. Sanford Cohen chief of psychiatry at Boston University School of Medicine, has made some studies that seem to indicate that hopelessness, that is, an image of no recovery, actually kills. If a doctor diagnoses a fatal disease and tells the patient, and if the patient loses hope and gives up, death comes quickly. An autopsy may show the malignancy all right, but no reason the patient should have died so soon. Ruth and I have lived quite a few years now, and both of us have been remarkably free of illness. Ruth attributes her good health in part to the fact that, as a child, she ate simple foods, mostly vegetables. She also thinks there is a strong connection between hard work and good health. If you keep really busy, she says, you don't have time to think about yourself or your health, or your lack of health. As for me, I'm convinced that human beings are supposed to be healthy. We're designed to be healthy. That's what the Creator intended when He made us, and I constantly image myself as a disease-free individual. We also have a responsibility not to abuse our bodies with alcohol, drugs, nicotine, or other harmful substances, or too much food for that matter. Nor should we abuse too much stress. It's hard to persuade people to avoid these things, especially young people, because they have great vitality and think they are immune to trouble and can go on indefinitely. They have to learn the hard way, and that can be unpleasant. So if your health isn't what it should be, if your life isn't what you want it to be, if you've not reached the level of attainment that you desire, then you can do what so many happy, successful people have done. Get yourself attached to the flow of spiritual power. You can't attach yourself to this incredible power by wanting to be attached. You can attach yourself by believing, by imaging and by following the Word. Then, once you're attached, you'll live with the power coursing through you. This power is no fantasy. It is reality, absolute reality, and one of incredible strength. 
it can and does enter into believing persons and thereby into situations in a way so astonishing that it should convince anyone, however skeptical, that imaging the power of God can affect persons, even situations, under the most difficult circumstances. Let us now devote some time to a discussion of marriage and where it stands today. What's the matter with modern marriage anyway? I think the answer is that there's nothing wrong with marriage. What is wrong is the concept, that is to say, the image of marriage that has prevailed in the last two or three decades, especially among our young people. Having been happily married for a lot of years, I know I tend to look at marriage from a point of view that must seem pretty old-fashioned to some members of the younger generation. I believe in monogamy, fidelity, total commitment to a married partner. I believe in these things because the Word of God tells us that is the way human beings are supposed to live, and he certainly knows the score. I'm getting married, and I hope it works, but maybe it won't. I'm married, but maybe I've made a mistake. Maybe I'd be happier not married to anyone. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Every single one of those maybes is a form of negative imaging. Each one represents an image of marital failure. Each leaves an escape hatch always open, and the more it's thought about or toyed with or dwelled upon, the stronger is the possibility that the escape hatch will be used. Imaging can also be a healing influence in marriages where cracks have appeared. Some years ago, a couple I had married wrote to me saying they were on the verge of divorce. In my reply, I urged them to carry out a week-long experiment that I said might save their marriage. I told them to get an alarm clock, one with a loud tick, then each morning go into a room with two chairs and spend 20 minutes in uninterrupted silence. In the first 10 minutes, I wanted them to visualize in vivid detail what their lives would be like after the divorce, the effect on the children, the guilt, the sense of loss, the whole dreary aftermath. Then, in the second 10 minutes, I urged them to recall as vividly as possible some of the happiest, most loving times they had known together. The memory of past happiness can point the compass of the unconscious mind toward the goal of similar happiness in the future. I told them finally to listen to the loud tick of the clock and that they would hear it repeating the word that was at the bottom of their troubles. Self, 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 self. Well, you know, it worked. And imaging had a lot to do with saving their marriage. Even when a clear, steady image of successful marriage is kept in mind, it is a relationship that must be constantly monitored, adjusted, and nourished. Here are seven suggestions that Ruth and I recommend to marriage partners. First, try to have a mature concept of what love really is. For too many Americans, love is a breathless, romantic glow in which they expect to have their own emotional needs gratified. Romantic love doesn't really change anyone. Mature love has a spiritual dimension that alters people profoundly and changes them from self-oriented to others. In mature love, the beloved's welfare and happiness becomes more important than your own. As someone said, real love is the accurate estimate and supply of another's needs. Second, work on communication constantly. No matter how long you've been married, you can never take lines of communication for granted. They need to be constantly used, tested, and, if necessary, repaired. Third, learn how to defer gratification. This is a combination of self-control and patience. Both partners have to be willing at times to put off or forego immediate pleasures or satisfaction in order to obtain greater benefits in the future. This may sound obvious, but I've seen the failure to do this wreck many marriages. Some people can't bring themselves to save money or work overtime, even if the future rewards are greater. Fourth, take responsibility. Accept the truth that marriage is going to be what you and one other person make it, no better and no worse. Face up to the fact that in any disagreement, you're not going to change your partner very much, if at all. The only person you can really change is you. But when you do change yourself by compromising sometimes or by accepting blame, the whole human equation changes and things often work out the way you want after all. The fifth recommendation is to learn to compromise. This doesn't mean giving in. It just means that you recognize that there are two or more sides to every question. Sometimes it helps to trade a bit in a good-humored way. 
If the husband will go to church on Sunday instead of playing golf, the wife will stop smoking. That sort of thing. Sixth, practice the art of appreciation. Everybody cherishes a word of praise. Some psychologists believe that the desire for approval is one of the strongest human traits, maybe even the strongest. Try complimenting your wife or husband just once a day. The resulting rush of affection will surprise you. Finally, strive always to increase the spiritual dimension of your life together. Marriage is a difficult and demanding relationship. People in it need all the help they can get. A simple and extremely practical rule is to keep God in the center of your life, and decisions will be sounder, joys will be greater, troubles will be more bearable, burdens will seem lighter. One of the most important lessons that people can learn as they move through life is how to forgive. Anger, resentment, and hatred set up barriers that deprive a person of spiritual power. Chronic malevolence, Smoldering anger or some terrible and long-lasting grudge are like cancerous growths. So forgiveness is not just a nice, praiseworthy virtue. It's a needed protection for yourself. It is an antidote for poisons that can corrupt and damage the soul. How do you set about becoming a forgiving individual? There are five steps, I think, will help you achieve this. Number one, resist the temptation to be judgmental. Remember, only God knows all the circumstances. Leave the judging to Him. Number two, learn to be compassionate. The best method is to put yourself in the other person's shoes. Ask yourself whether the fault is entirely the other person's or whether there is some blame on your own part. Number three, image the whole problem in terms of reconciliation. Visualize the broken relationship healed. Number four, pray for the person who has offended you. And number five, end your prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Give special thought and emphasis to the part that asks God to forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Do these five things, and you'll be amazed at the healing power of forgiveness. If you let it, it can change your life. What is this thing called tension, this painful feeling called tension? It's not easy to define. Fear can cause it, but it's not exactly fear. Worry can cause it, so can guilt, hate, or frustration. One thing is sure, we all know the dismal feeling that comes when tension digs its claws into us. The sense of strain, the feelings of inadequacy, the pessimism, the low boiling point. Years ago, I ran across a pamphlet that gave a remedy for acute tension that I've been using and recommending ever since. It is a three-part remedy, and one of those parts involves imaging although that word was not in use at the time. The pamphlet said to get rid of excess tension, you had to do three things. The first was to practice relaxation of the physical body. Sag back in your chair, it said. Start relaxing every muscle beginning with your toes and continuing all over your body. The second stage is the relaxation of the mind. This requires an effort of concentrated imagination. Picture yourself in a beautiful, warm, and enchanting place. In the silence, your uptightness fades away. Tension is no more. You are at peace. The third part of the remedy involved a deliberate attempt to refresh the soul by recalling and meditating upon great passages and great promises from the Scriptures. I have often found that one of the best antidotes for uptightness is simply to recite aloud the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. They do indeed. Among the useful imaging techniques for tension control that have come to my attention is a unique procedure outlined by Jo Kimmel in her book, Steps to Prayer Power. She suggests a process of imaging in which one visualizes all the unhealthy mixture of thought which causes tension as flowing out of the body through the toes and fingers until an emptying of stress is achieved. The emptying procedure is followed by a refilling process in which a healthy mixture of thought composed of serenity, wholeness, joy, and peace is imaged as being poured into the body to circulate throughout the entire being. The result is a feeling of relaxation and rest, a diminution of tension. Another important aspect to enhancing your life is to implement imaging in your everyday life. 
So far, imaging has been presented only as a powerful device to achieve major goals and objectives, and so it is. But imaging can be used in many lesser ways to smooth out the minor wrinkles of living. Suppose you'd like to redecorate a room in your house or buy new furniture for the patio. Suppose, as is so often the case, you don't think you can afford to do it right away. What's to prevent you from imaging that room or that patio just the way you'd like to have it? Fill in all the details, the color of the curtains, the pattern of the carpet, the kind of mirror you want above the mantelpiece. See it all in your mind's eye. It's a lot of fun, it doesn't cost a thing, and the more vivid the image, the better chance that someday it will become a reality. Does this kind of dreaming, which is just another form of imaging, guarantee that someday you will get what you want? No, but it raises the probability enormously. The imaging process can also play a part in making and keeping friends. How do you conduct your life so that people are drawn to you? How do you get people to have a favorable attitude towards you? How do you persuade people to love or like you? These are important questions for everyone. One of the deepest drives in human nature is the desire to be appreciated, which is just another way of saying that everyone wants to be liked. We all have this desire, and yet you know that some people have more success in this area than others. These people seem to win friends easily and readily. They're popular. They're considered attractive or charming or helpful or likable. People in trouble turn to them. But there are other individuals who are not like that. Something seems to block them off from other people. They don't attract, they repel. And this is often a sad and painful thing, because they feel isolated and friendless without quite knowing why. If you feel that someone dislikes you and that therefore you have grounds for disliking him, what should you do about it? The first and most advisable thing to do is to take a long, dispassionate look at yourself. If you want to associate on a good, friendly, normal, creative level with other people, you have to do a job on yourself until you like yourself. Imaging can help because you can zero in on a character flaw and then picture yourself acting in the opposite manner. Take anger, for example, an extremely unpleasant characteristic almost guaranteed to cause you to lose friends and make enemies. Suppose you know you have a quick temper. When something ignites it, hold a picture in your mind of yourself calmly extinguishing the fire of anger. Or if you can't completely put it out, at least delay it. Very often the best cure for anger is delay. So the first step in making friends and keeping them is to get yourself straightened out. And what is the second step? It's helping your neighbor think more highly of himself. If you can just do that, you'll never have to look around for friends. They'll come to you. They will flock to you. Do you lack friends? Take an acquaintance or several acquaintances. Study them for a bit. Then select their best attribute and praise them for it. This doesn't mean fulsome or insincere flattery. It means a fair and friendly recognition of something worthwhile in them. That recognition will increase their self-esteem, and they will eagerly give their friendship to the person who does that for them. Another simple way to make friends is to help people, not just when they ask for help, but also when you see that they need it. Human beings always know when you love them and they will respond with love. That is the ultimate basis of friendship. There is one image that is more important than all the other images combined, the image that you have of yourself. If you firmly image that you're a person destined for success, success is what you ultimately will have. If you're convinced that you will fail, failure will stalk you no matter where you go. If you think scarcity, it will befall you. If you image abundance flowing to you, it will flow. The universe is like a great echo chamber. Sooner or later, what you send out comes back. If you love people, that love will be reflected to you. If you sow anger and hatred, anger and hatred are what you will reap. If you think mainly of yourself and your own interests, people will never be drawn to you. If you put others first and yourself last, everyone will be your friend. Well, suppose your self-image is not all it should be. Can you do something about it? Of course you can. A weak self-image is not a natural state of mind. You weren't born with it. A newborn baby has a perfectly sound opinion of himself. No, you acquired it as you went along. 
You acquired it the way you acquire any other characteristic, good or bad. You practiced it. You practiced it into your mind. And what you practice in, you can practice out. So here are some suggestions designed to help you do just that. First, see yourself as a child of God. This is the greatest of all antidotes to fear. Second, stand in front of the mirror and take a good look at yourself. Check out your external appearance. Do you look discouraged or defeated? Make yourself stand straight and tall. Your appearance reflects and affects your image of yourself. If you improve one, you improve the other. Then look at the inner person. Do you doubt your ability to cope with life? If so, admit your qualms, but also tell yourself that with God's help, you're going to do something about them. Third, decide to treble your capacity for imaging. If you consistently picture the best, not the worst, happening to you, powerful forces will work to bring about the circumstances you visualize. Fourth, practice what you do well, and then learn from your successes. Nothing builds confidence, and with it a strong self-image, like the repetition of superior performance. Fifth, condition your unconscious mind with spiritual principles. The best way to do this is to memorize key scripture passages and repeat them until they sink down into your unconscious mind and become part of it. Sixth, sensitize yourself to the beauty and variety and excitement of living. Don't just take it all for granted. Are you ever fascinated by the infinite variety of form and color, light and shadow that surrounds you? Life is a marvelous gift. Accept it. See it. Hear it. Touch it. Smell it. Taste it. Live it. Seventh, control your emotions. If you don't, they may push you into situations that could seriously damage or weaken the image you have of yourself. The last and most important suggestion I have to make is simply this. Commit your life to God and keep an active relationship with Him. With God by your side, you can have the most sublime of all positive images. Your victory in this life and the next will be assured.